Hello everyone and welcome to the tutorial on computer optimization on quantum computers. My name is Ruslan Scheidelin, I am Maria Goppert Meyer Fellow at Argonne National Laboratory and I will be your presenter this morning. Our tutorial has four parts. In the first part, I will explain how the computer optimization problems can be mapped to quantum computers and solved using quantum approximate optimization algorithm. In the second part, I will guide you through implementing the things you learned using in Python using Qiskit. In the third part, Dr. Ilya Safro of Clemson University will discuss decomposition methods that enable solving larger problems that do not fit on small near-term quantum computers directly. Finally, in the fourth part, Dr. Yuri Alexeyev will discuss the modern methods for simulating QAOA. I hope you enjoy the tutorial. Let me begin by talking about some of the big picture considerations we should have before uh, talking about solving optimization problems on quantum computers. In general, when reasoning about the complexity of solving problems, and this of course includes optimization problems, we're usually interested in how the time or memory requirements grow with problem size. Or in other words, we're interested in asymptotic complexity. Classically, the most kind of famous classes of problems that uh, all of problems that we want to solve fall into are either P class, solve problems that are solvable in polynomial time, and P, non-deterministic polynomial, polynomial, problems where we can verify the proof of the solution in polynomial time, and P space, solvable in polynomial time, polynomial space, and unlimited time. On the quantum side, the co complexity class that we are most interested in is BQP, uh, bounded error quantum polynomial time which uh, includes problems that are solvable on a quantum computer in polynomial time with an error probability of at most one-third for all instances. And it is, for our purposes, roughly the equivalent of classical P class. This is the relationship between these classes. So in the middle, the smallest one, this is P, problems that are solvable in polynomial time. We know it's included both in NP and BQP and both of them are included in p-space. We do not yet quite know whether uh, what is the relationship between BQP and NP. For example, the problem of finding the shortest path between two nodes in a graph is in p. There's a polynomial time algorithm for it. A problem like integer factorization is inside BQP because there exists Shor's algorithm, so there's a polynomial time algorithm quantumly for it, and it is inside NP, because we can verify the proof by just multiplying the two factors and checking if it indeed produces the correct integer. So it is an NP. But we do not know whether it, it, is, it belongs to P or not, and we think that probably not. And uh, some problems are NP complete, that is as hard as any problem in NP. And this is, for example, this class contains maximum cut problem, which we're going to talk about more today. And it's kind of a paradigmatic problem for quantum optimization, mostly because of its relationship with uh, Ising spin glasses, which are well studied in physics. But it is an NP complete problem, right? But it's only NP complete by definition, right? In the worst case, that's what it means to be. And be complete. The complexity, asymptotic complexity of a problem defi is defined as worst case asymptotic complexity. However, if you look at a particular instance, for example, maximum cut on a cycle graph, right? This problem is no longer NP complete. It's actually quite easy. Yeah, there's a polynomial algorithm, polynomial time algorithm for it. You just go through the graph and you pick each of every other node. Or if you think of a max cut on a bipartite graph, right? That's like, once again, that is a trivial problem. And this is kind of an issue because in general, worst case instances, instances that trigger these worst case bounds are difficult to construct and uh, proving asymptotic performance of algorithms is even more difficult. So often what people resort to is just running the algorithm and looking at the numerics and seeing you know, how well it scales. But given the difficulty of finding hard instances, this should be always taken with a grain of salt and great care really should be applied when talking about 
quantum optimization and its performance. However, you know, all of this is important and difficult, but we are not really going to what worry about it too much today. We're definitely not going to solve the complete problems in polynomial time today. And we're not going to be thinking too much about this polynomial hierarchy and where algorithms fit in it. Instead, we're going to adopt a different perspective. Classically, uh, there are many al algorithms that have proven performance, like, for example, matrix multiplication, the naive method. It's always all n cubed and you get the correct answer or Dijkstra's algorithm for shortest path. And quantumly, there are also algorithms with proven performance, such as Schwarz factor algorithm for integer factoring or Grover's algorithm for unstructured search. Right? And for those, we know exactly where they fall in this uh, kind of complexity uh, Venn diagram. But some of the most powerful classical methods, methods that are at the bleeding edge, are heuristics. For example, gradient descent for non-convex problems, which is how most of machine learning works. Right? It's a heuristic if it's a not convex problem, or simulate annealing, or a genetic algorithm. And similarly, the algorithm that we're going to talk about today, quantum approximate optimization algorithm, is a heuristic. And many of the most powerful, the state-of-the-art classical algorithms are heuristics, algorithms that are used every day. And we have no reason to think that quantum will be any different. And what makes this very exciting is that the noisy intermediate scale quantum hardware that is becoming available starts to provide this uh, unique opportunity to uh, develop and numerically evaluate quantum heuristic methods and discover perhaps quantum advantage where we cannot rigorously show that the asymptotic scaling is what we want, what we want it to be. Let us now switch gears and talk about mapping computer optimization problems onto quantum computers. And in the third part, we're going to talk about how to solve them. But we first, before solving them, we have to map them. I'm going to start by walking you through maximum cut as a paradigmatic example, and probably the most kind of well-studied problem for quantum optimization. And then from the tools that I've shown you in Maximum Cut and from the understanding that we develop in talking about Maximum Cut, I will show you general rules for constructing Hamiltonians representing Boolean functions. And that will provide you with a more general framework for mapping your particular problem onto quantum computers, the problem that you are interested in. So what is Maximum Cut? The goal of maximum cut is to split the set of vertices V of a graph into two disjoint parts such that the number of edges spanning two parts is maximized. For example, on the right here, if color denotes part, so red nodes are in one part and green nodes are in another, in this graph, four edges are cut. And if we assign each, ver each vertex a binary variable, plus or minus one, a binary spin variable, then it can be formulated as an optimization problem, as shown below. It's easy to see that this is a correct formulation. Just look at this term and see that if the two variables are in the same part, which means they have the same sign, then this term has no contribution to the objective. Contribution to the objective is zero from this edge. Whereas if they have different signs, then it is one minus uh, minus one, so the contribution of the objective is one, so an edge is cut. And then once you sum it over all edges, you get your cut. For example, in this bipartite graph, where we have two nodes in one part and three nodes in the other part, all six edges are cut. So how do we take this classical problem and map it onto a quantum computer? And in order to solve an optimization problem on a quantum computer, what we have to do is we have to take this classical optimization problem and convert it into a problem of characterizing a quantum Hamiltonian, or in the language of mathematics, a Hermitian operator. And so then our solution classically, which is a binary string, which is the solution to our classical optimization problem, now becomes the 
highest energy eigenstate or in a less physics-y terms, largest eigenvalue eigenvector of this Hermitian operator or of this Hamiltonian. And as a side note, since the Hamiltonian is classical, we know that this eigenstate is a computational basis state or uh, the largest eigenvalue is achieved with a computational basis state. For example, if our eigenstate is actually a linear position of, our, of computational basis state. But uh, the point is, we can get this eigenvalue with, we can get the solution with certainty because if we can prepare this eigenstate, then we're just going to sample the computational basis states that correspond to the solution. Now, what does this Hamiltonian look like? Uh, this Hamiltonian is diagonal, and the values on the diagonal correspond to the values of the objective function. So if we have a problem, say, maximize f of x, and the x takes all the values on the Boolean cube and dimensional Boolean cube, then our Hamiltonian has on its diagonal value of function f on 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, etc., until f value of f on the binary string 1, 1, 1, 1, 1. And note that it's a 2 to the power of n by 2 to the power of n operator. And if you kind of squint at it and think about what it does, if we apply it, for example, onto the vacuum state, on the computational basis state with all zeros, then this computational basis state has exactly one non-zero amplitude, and it's the first element of the vector. So if you multiply the two matrices, you'll see that it uh, adds a factor of that is equal to the value of function on this binary string. And this in general is what we're looking for. This is what it means for the Hamiltonian to realize a classical function. So we want it to act on any computational basis state as the value of a function. So C applied to ket x should be equal to f of x ket x. And this is now our Hamiltonian. Right. Note that this Hamiltonian is too large to construct explicitly. First, it's to the power of n by two to the power of n, so it's exponential in size. And second, if we were to construct it explicitly, it's kind of a silly way of solving the problem, right? Because now what you really have to do is you have to go to the diagonal and pick the largest element, and then that would be your solution. In the row in which the largest element sits, we'll encode the solution to the problem which, of course, you don't need a quantum computer for. But what we're going to do is we're going to, we're never going to construct it, this Hamilton explicitly. Instead, we're going to develop compact formulations. And we're going to construct this operator from basic building blocks, which are going to be Pauli Z operators for us. And we're going to build compact polynomial time, polynomial size representation for this operator. And then this would let us uh, solve it on a quantum computer without having to construct it explicitly and have to deal with this exponentially sized operator classically. So now the question is, how do we construct it? And as I said earlier, first I'm going to show you how to construct it for a for max cut problem, and it's just a simple example and we can work, walk through it. And then I'm going to give you general rules that rely on Fourier analysis of Boolean function functions. As a notation reminder, uh, cat x is simply a column vector. Uh, bra y is a conjugate transpose of it, and bra is a, uh, arrow points in the other way. Note that both uh, brackets, both cat and bra, are simply notation for vectors. It's no different than putting an error over the label for the vector. Then. Uh, bra y cat x denotes the inner product between y and x and if the errors are pointing toward each other that denotes outer product or if it's if x is equals to y then it's easy to see that this is a, exactly a projection operator that projects onto x okay with this we are ready to construct the hamiltonian recall that this is our objective 
So we want to construct a Hamiltonian that represents, that faithfully represents this objective. And as you remember, what it means to faithfully represent the objective is this. We want the action of the Hamiltonian on a computational basis state x to be c of x, x. And what I'm claiming is that this Hamiltonian that I've written out above is the correct Hamiltonian. Namely, that all we need to do is we need to take our binary variables si in minus 1 and plus 1 and replace them with the Pauli z operator. And over the next couple of slides, I'm going to show you that this is in, indeed the correct way of doing it. So this is our main building block, Pauli z operator. <clears throat> Just by looking at it, uh, you can quickly note that it has eigenvalues minus 1 and plus 1 with eigenvectors being computational basis state. So just taking z and applying it to computational basis state 0, which is a vector, column vector 1, 0, it gives you z 0, uh, gives you the vector 1, one 0 back out. And similarly, applying it to 1 gives you minus 1 uh, factor in front of 1. <coughs> More concisely, we can write it out in this way. So action of z on x is minus 1 to the power of x, cat x, for x and 0 and 1. Now, if it's acting on ith qubit, what it means is, what, what zi means, and this will, we will use this notation going forward, is it's z on ith qubit and its tensor product with identity on all other qubits. And what this does, so identity goes through and does nothing, where zi adds a factor of minus 1 to the power of xi. Now if we have two of those, we have zi, zj. This is similarly means that every, everywhere else we have identity, so we tensor product it, it with identity. And identities go through, but each of the z's adds minus 1 to the power of xi or minus 1 to the power of xj factor in front. And note here that we reorder the qubits so the i's and j are adjacent. So recall that this is our objective. And I hope you see where I'm going with this now. But all we have to do is to replace, do this variable change where we go from si in minus 1 and plus 1 to xi in 0 and 1, and the change is minus 1 to the power of xi is equal to si. And it's easy to show that it is indeed correct change. And keep in mind this change, we're going to do it later, and kind of this change is what enables us to go, this change of variables what enables us to go between binary variables 0 and 1 and spin variables minus 1 and plus 1. And we kind of go between them willy-nilly but this is the change that the variable change that lets us do that. And so with this variable change, this is our new objective. We're maximizing over x, one half sum over edges one minus minus one to the power of xi minus one to the power of xj. And here I hope you see how the eigenvalues of Pauli Z and the action of Pauli Z on computational basis state X matches this exactly. So what we want to show is that the action of this c is equal to on cat x is equal to c of x cat x, and we're going to do just that. So c applies to cat x is equal one half uh, sum of edges identity minus z i z j. Now identity does nothing, so we can uh, move x zero uh, x out and leave x minus z i z j x. And then zizjx, as I've shown you, is equal to minus 1. It adds a factor of minus 1 to the power of xi, minus 1 to the power of xj. And this is exactly the action of the value of function, of our objective function on binary string x. And so they, this concludes the demonstration that this Hamiltonian, one half sum over, over edges identity minus zizj, is the correct Hamiltonian to, rep, to faithfully represent our objective function. And note that this technique, just taking the operate the binary variable si that is in minus one and plus one and replacing it or mapping it onto the eigenvalues of Pauli z, this procedure would work for any unconstrained binary objective. 
So if you have, say, a cubic, fact, cubic term there, then you can do the same thing. And let's quickly come back here to the question of the size of this operator. Rem remember that ZIZJ is a means that is a notation, a synthetic sugar, if you will, indicating that it has identities on all of the qubits. So this Hamiltonian is, as I've said before, is a two, par two to the power of n by two to the power of n matrix, if it was written out explicitly. But because we're writing it out in terms of Pauli Z operators, this actually gives us a compact representation of this operator. So it only has uh, E terms, so one term per edge. So it has only a linear number of terms. Uh, linear is a function of number of edges. And I'm going to show you in a bit how to simulate this Hamiltonian efficiently on a quantum computer. So you're never explicitly writing it out. Okay. But this is not... So what is the principle that allows us to do this mapping? So I've given you this trick of make, mapping binary variables uh, SI onto the spectrum of Pauli Z. But what is the general rule of doing it? What is the, in general, if we have some function f of x on Boolean hypercube, how do we construct a Hamiltonian, a diagonal Hamiltonian acting on qubits that faithfully represents this function f of x? What I'm going to show you is a general framework for doing it that relies on the Fourier analysis of Boolean functions. And hopefully this will elucidate a little bit the mechanics of what is going on here. And let's start with an you know, even more trivial example than max cut. Let's start with a max Boolean function that just returns the maximum of two bits. And here we go to spin variables, minus one and plus one, by doing the change of variables. And of course, we can always go back. N know that this maximum function can be expressed in a multilinear polynomial. And multilinear here simply means that in no point in the polynomial any variable is squared or any higher power. It's always uh, power one. But there can be a combination of different variables in each term. And uh, in general, we can do this for any function, right? Any function can be represented as a multilinear polynomial with up to two to the power of n terms, where each term corresponds to the subset, some subset of indices. And the reason we can do it is by noticing that we can represent a Boolean function as sum of its value on some binary string A times the indicator polynomial. And the indicator polynomial is defined as it takes one if x is equals to a, and it takes zero otherwise. <clears throat> and it's trivial to construct. This is the construction of the indicator polynomial. But all it does is it takes one if a is equal to x and zero otherwise. And so sum of f of a times a function that is only that is one if x is equals to a and zero otherwise, this is equal to f of x. And by using this way, uh, this definition, it's easier to recover our multilinear polynomial, which, of course, can be exponentially large. And uh, the notation we're going to use is we're going to represent the monomial corresponding to some subset of indices S as x to the power of s, which is just product of uh, xi. And we're going to do for if s is equal to empty set, we're going to let set it to 1 by convention. And now we are ready to define the Fourier expansion of a Boolean function. So this multilinear polynomial representation is called Fourier expansion of Boolean function f. And the coefficients are called Fourier co coefficients. And so for for maximum function, right, it's Fourier coefficients are one half, one half, one half, and minus one half. Once again, note that this is in general hard to construct. 
However, we do know that every function, every Boolean function can be uniquely expressed as multilinear polynomial, has a unique Fourier expansion, which is what we're going to use later. Now let's go back, go on the other side and look at what's going on on the quantum side. So we want to construct a Hamiltonian that's a faithful representation of f of x. And what we can rewrite it, rewrite this above equation, is in the below form, which is equivalent form, and defines uh, Hamiltonian as a sum over all binary string x, f of x times projector onto x. And this hopefully already reminds you of the form of the form of the Fourier expansion form where we start with representing Boolean, classical Boolean function as a sum of f of a times projector onto a or indicator polynomial of a. This is exactly that. And now when we start with this, now what we do is we have to apply the Fourier expansion. So how does it happen on the quantum side? Well, what we note is that this x to the power of s or a parity function is implemented exactly by products of Pauli z operators. And this is a trivial expansion of the trivial extension of the previous of the result I've shown you for the max cut. You can easily check that it is indeed product of xi, where xi is a binary variable, just by the because of Pauli, because of the eigenvalue, eigenvalues of Pauli z are minus one and plus one. And so what this gives us is now we can implement parity functions on a quantum computer. So if we take the Fourier expansion of the, our classical Boolean function and just plug in those Fourier coefficients and replace the, the monomial x to the power of x s with a product of Pauli z operators, this gives us a unique n qubit Hamiltonian representing function f. So the recipe for constructing this unique and qubit Hamiltonian representing, faithfully representing function f, is we first perform Fourier expansion of the desired function, and then we plug those coefficients into this formula. So we add the, each coefficient is multiplied by the corresponding product of Pauli z's. And this is a general recipe. And this is kind of why this works, why it is always possible to construct this unique n qubit Hamiltonian. Now, this is not a very practical recipe, perhaps, because for a general Boolean function, it is uh, pound hard to compute the Fourier expansion. However, if we have a Boolean function that is a, a combination of some of the simpler building blocks, then we can use this, basically this table of how to map simple Boolean building blocks, and we we can combine them using these rules below. And this is perhaps a more practical recipe. So for example, as an exercise, it's you should try to recover the max cut using these, the max cut Hamiltonian using these building blocks and confirming that it does indeed work. And with this, uh, you can construct most practical Boolean functions just by using these building blocks and combining them as those rules describe. So I've told you how to construct a Hamiltonian representing your problem. Now what we want to do is we want to solve this Hamiltonian using a quantum computer. We're going to do it using the quantum approximate optimization algorithm. And what it is in a nutshell, and we're going to go into mechanism and the details of it a little bit later, but if you were to take away kind of one thing about QA way, is it prepares this parameterized trial state where it starts in the vacuum state and applies a layer of Hadamards and then it applies these pairs of alternating operators where first operator is our problem Hamiltonian is exponentiated problem Hamiltonian the second operator is exponentiated sum of Pauli x operators on each qubit which is the mixer Hamiltonian so at each step we prepare this parameterized trial state 
And you notice that each of those exponentiated operators has a parameter in it, beta for the mixer and gamma for the problem Hamiltonian. And then what we do is we use a classical optimizer to vary the parameters beta and gamma to bring this trial state as close as possible to our target state, which is the ground state or the highest energy eigenstate of our problem Hamiltonian. And we use this uh, energy, the f of beta and gamma, is the function that is fed into classical optimizer. You will see in more detail how this works in the hands-on session. But first, why is this a good idea? Well, first, and I will show you this later, that the connection to adiabatic quantum evolution. But in a nutshell, with enough steps, there are multiple arguments why QAOA would get to the optimal solution. For one, it can at least exactly approximate adiabatic quantum evolution. But I think there are also other explanations for why. With P approximating infinity, QAOA can get the optimal solution. Now, we do not execute P approximating infinity, infinite number of steps, infinite number of operators on a quantum computer. Right? Are, they're noisy in the NISC era. We can only execute a few gates. So with shorter P, the picture is mixed. I will show you how to simulate QAOA. Uh, you'll get a sense to, that, for example, evaluating the energy is not hard for small P. But, for, but sampling from QAOA is indeed hard, even for small p. And uh, there was a couple of other results that indicate that there is some potential for quantum advantage using the sunsets, which I want to highlight is quite different from some of the other ansatzes. For example, so-called hard, very efficient ansatzes for optimization. There is really no evidence at this point that there can achieve any amount of a quantum advantage for optimization. But for QAOA, we at least can make some arguments for why it is a good ansatz to use. But the question is then, how do we implement this circuit in gates? Right? What is exponent of minus i gamma c as it implemented in gates? We're going to assume a standard gate set, probably XYZ, Hadamard, and uh, one gate of note is a rotation around z by theta which is defined as exponent of minus i theta probably z over 2. And just from looking at this gate, you might see that it is a, a simulation of this simple operator, 1 qubit exponentiated probably z, time evolution with probably z, and the circuit implementing this simple operator exponent of minus i z t is just r z. And the reason it is, is just by, by definition. Now, for a more complicated operator, so now we have a two-body term, z z in there. Uh, we have to know that, uh, if, that if a has eigenvalue lambda with eigenvector v, then exponent of a applied to v equals to exponent of lambda applied, applied to v times v. And so from this, we can construct, we can recover the action of this operator on all computational basis states. And what we notice is that it adds a phase factor with the sign dependent on parity. As you remember, product of Pauli z operators computes a parity function. So we see this here again. And with this, it's easy for us to construct the circuit that does it. It is C0, RZ, C0. So C0 takes A, B into A, parity of A and B, A, X or B. Then the RZ adds a phase factor. And then the C0 undoes the change to the second qubit. And so this overall circuit adds a phase based on the parity of qubits. Now, we have more than one ZZ term in there. But since they commute, Pauli Z operators commute, we can just concatenate corresponding circuits. So exponent of minus I A Z I Z J T minus I B Z J Z K T 
is just equal to the product of exponent of minus i a z i z j t, exponent of minus i b z z j z k t. And because they commute, we can just concatenate the corresponding circuits. So we can simulate them independently and combine the circuits. And with this, we now know how to simulate the operator corresponding to the problem Hamiltonian, the phase separation operator, to the exponent of minus i gamma c. And this is half of our QAOA circuit. Now the only thing we need to simulate is to is the mixer operator, the exponent of minus i beta b, which is sum of Pauli axis on all qubits. And what the way we do it is basically taking our is basically taking this operator and diagonalizing it. And the way we diagonalize it is by sandwiching between two Hadamards. And this is kind of a universal technique for simulating things. So you want to diagonalize it and then uh, simulate the diagonal operator using Pauli Z's. And here, the way we diagonalize it, and it's very easy to see by just taking the Taylor series expansion of exponent of minus i z t can be diagonalized by sandwiching in between Hadamards. And so the circuit is just Hadamard and then the circuit for exponent of i z t, which is r z, and another Hadamard. And with this, we know how to simulate the entire QAOA circuit, right? We can now simulate the, the problem Hamiltonian. We can now simulate the mixer Hamiltonian. And we will see in hands-on session how this can be implemented in code. But from this, it should be fairly clear how this can be done. Now, how does QAOA actually solve the problem, right? So we have this ansatz state, and we start in some with in uniform position. We want to prepare the target state. At each step, we prepare this trial state by applying this circuit. And then what we do is we vary the parameters beta and gamma using a classical optimizer to get our trial state as close as possible to the target state. And crucially, our ability to find good solution depends on our ability to find good parameters. And this will also be highlighted in the hands-on part. Now, what I want to spend some time on is clarifying the connection between QAOA and adiabatic quantum computation for many reasons. One, it frequently comes up is, for example, the explanation for power of QAOA. It also informs some of the techniques for parameter choice, namely using adiabatic-like or annealing-like schedules can potentially reduce the need to optimize the parameters beta and gamma and solve this hard optimization problem. So what is adiabatic quantum computation? The idea is that we want to find the ground or highest energy eigenstate of some problem Hamiltonian by performing adiabatic evolution from some simple, from an eigenstate of some simple Hamiltonian that we know how to prepare. And what it leverages is, is the adiabatic approximation theorem, which states roughly that a system prepared in an eigenstate of some time-dependent Hamiltonian will remain in this corresponding eigenstate, provided that we perform the change quote unquote, slowly enough. And so what we're going to do is we're going to use this time dependent Hamiltonian here, where we start with some simple Hamiltonian HD, and then we smoothly change our Hamiltonian into the problem Hamiltonian HP. Now the trick, the tricky bit here is that the slowness of it is uh, quadratic uh, is 1 over delta squared, where the delta is the eigengap, the minimum instantaneous eigengap between the ground and the first excited state of this Hamiltonian. So, And this gap can be exponentially small. So in general, this might take exponentially long time. So how do, how do we apply it for max cut? Our problem Hamiltonian is uh, I minus, is the Hamiltonian we've already seen, I minus Zi, Zj, and our 
simple Hamiltonian, our initial Hamiltonian is going to be transverse field, which is probably x on h operator, which is the same as our mixer Hamiltonian in QAOA. So how do we simulate this time-dependent Hamiltonian on a quantum computer? And to answer that, let's go back to the very basics, to Schrodinger equation. So consider a general quantum evolution defined by unitary u. So we start with a, in psi of time at time zero, and we want to get to psi at time t by applying some unitary, that's a time-dependent unitary. The evolution is described by Schrodinger equation. And for a time-dependent Hamiltonian, the solution of this equation, u of t, is exponent of the minus i integral from zero of t, h of t dt. And this is where the exponentiation comes from. So what does it mean to exponentiate the, the problem Hamiltonian in QAOA? This exponentiation just means that we're simulating the evolution of the system with this Hamiltonian for time gamma, or with the mixer, it's simulating the evolution of the system with this Hamiltonian for time beta. For, and really, this equation is the right one, because this is an equation for time-independent Hamiltonian. This is the solution of the Schrodinger equation for time-independent Hamiltonian. Now, what if our Hamiltonian has non-commuting terms, right? So we could with QAA, we could stop here, because we can just simulate this operator, because all of the terms of our Hamiltonian commute. Now, in a diabetic quantum evolution, in a diabetic Hamiltonian, the term do not commute. So what we have to do is we have to apply the Trotter decomposition. Let's take our time-dependent Hamiltonian and let's discretize it so we can apply the decomposition to it. So we're going to bring it, break it up in these small chunks where each chunk we can consider to be approximately constant over the interval. So we can approximate it with a time-independent Hamiltonian. So we're taking our time-dependent Hamiltonian and we're approximated with a series of, with a very long series of time-independent Hamiltonians. And so our Hamiltonian is now a product, our, now the, our operator from, is now the, our operator is a product of these uh, time-independent Hamiltonians. And now we can apply Trotter Suzuki decomposition to it. And by applying the decomposition to it, we can decompose the H of J delta T, which we still has non-commuting terms in it. And we can break it down into stuff, things that we can simulate, namely the exponent of Pauli X and exponent of Pauli Zs. And by applying this decomposition, we get something that should be very familiar to you. Namely, we get back our QAOA ansatz. So if you look at this decomposition side by side with QAOA, I've rewritten QAOA to match the form, you see that, so on the left we have QAOA, on the right we have adiabatic, discretized adiabatic computation. And you see that they're equivalent if you set p to be large, and if you set gamma and beta to be these uh, small, small steps. And this is the connection between QAOA and discretized or simulated adiabatic quantum computation. Now, don't this connection, don't let this connection fool you, because in small p regime, the mechanism of QAOA is actually quite different. And even in large p regime, it is quite different. And I want to, as one example of a paper that highlights this difference, is this paper that shows how to recover Grover's quadratic speed up using QAOA circuits, this alternates an operator circuit, but using a mechanism that is different from the mechanism that adiabatic quantum computation uses. The last thing I want to discuss is the possibility of training QAOA purely classically in shallow depth regime. So as you remember, QA prepares this parameterized trial state, and what we do is we evaluate f of beta and gamma, which I'm going to call QAOA energy. And 
This is what we use to find optimal parameters beta and gamma. So if we had a way to efficiently evaluate f of beta and gamma in shallow depth, then we can train QA away purely classically. And note that uh, it's still not possible in general to sample from QA away classically for hard Hamiltonians, but sometimes it's possible to evaluate the energy classically. So we still need a quantum computer to sample, but we can perhaps train QA away without using quantum computer. What I'm gonna do, I'm gonna walk you through the math of it. It's gonna be a little bit messy, but hopefully it'll give you a deep understanding of what's causing this. So let's denote the, our operators by U of B beta and U of C gamma. And let's look at QA energy for P equals one. So S is our uniform superposition. And we can take the identity out and this will give, give us a number of edges over two term. And then on the right, we have this minus one half sum over edges. And then this operator that is centered around Z, J, Z, K. And I'm gonna call this the contribution of the edge J, K to our energy. And it's just sum over edges of this contribution from of, of this, sum over edges of these contributions from linearity. And now what I'm gonna show you is that for each edge, this contribution only depends on some local information. And for a bounded degree graph, this the amount of graph that you need to look to evaluate this energy is much smaller than the entire thing. And in fact, it's constant. And I'm going to show you by basically showing that the terms commute through, the terms that do not touch the qubits JK commute through. So let's go through it step by step. So this contribute one contribution of one edge. And let's go through it step by step from the middle out. So we're going to start with the middle two terms, U dagger B beta, Z, Z, J, Z, K, U, B beta. And what you can note is that if you unroll them into their proper form, is that whenever in this product, whenever M is not equal to either J or K, we can commute the corresponding term in the product through ZJ, ZK and cancel it out as below. So the only mixer terms that are left are the terms acting on qubits JK. So for the first bit, we only need the terms of the mixer that involve directly qubits JK. Now, similarly, we can show that all terms in our phase separating Hamiltonian or the exponent of minus IC gamma similarly commute through, except when either when one of the Z terms touches either J qubit or qubit J or qubit K. And so for P equals one, we only we are only dependent on the terms that are in the neighborhood of JK. That is, they are the edges that are touching the edge JK in Max Cut example. And so the number of qubits that we need to simulate is only as many as can be reached by doing this one step from the edge JK. And that's what we're gonna denote by reverse causal cone of ZJ, ZK. These are these qubits in this neighborhood. And so, for example, if we have a three regular graph in P equals one, in the worst case for P equals one, we only need to simulate six qubits because each, each end of the edge can bring in two other qubits into play. So we're only simulating six qubits to evaluate the energy of one edge and so for the entire thing, we need to do for each edge simulate at most six qubits. And this way we can evaluate QAOA energy even if we have you know, thousands of qubits. And so we can train QAOA on very large problem sizes without having to simulate the full QAOA circuit. Note that if we keep bringing any operators, so we have P equals 2, then from this, similarly, they will bring into play 
more terms corresponding to the neighborhood of these new qubits and the rest will commute and cancel out as shown up as above and so the light cone will grow but it will grow with depth and it will grow unfortunately exponentially with depth uh, in general but for something like a mesh right it will only go grow polynomially with depth so kind of the simulatability of qaoa depends on the density of our graph This concludes the first part of the tutorial. To summarize what we've learned today, first, QAOA will not solve NP-complete problems in polynomial time. That is not the right way of thinking about QAOA. However, QAOA is a promising heuristic for the noisy intermediate scale quantum era, and it has the potential for demonstrating quantum advantage, that is, solving some optimization problem better or faster than state-of-the-art classical algorithms. Second, for any Boolean function or a Boolean objective that we want to optimize on n bits, we can construct a unique n-qubit Hamiltonian representing it. And we can do it by the means of Fourier expansion of the Boolean function. Or more practically, if it's a Boolean function expressed in a polynomial number of local terms, we can construct it using the table that I've shown you earlier. QAOA as an algorithm is deeply connected to a diabetic quantum optimization algorithm. However, its mechanism is not limited to the diabetic mechanism. In fact, the mechanism is still subject of debate, but it is different. And finally, QAOA energy can be often evaluated purely classically in shallow depth. This allows training of QAOA without access to a quantum computer and only performing the sampling on a quantum computer, potentially greatly accelerating the running time of QAOA. Coming up in the next sessions is the hands-on part of this tutorial, which will show you how to apply things you've learned in this theory part in Python to implementing QAOA and running QAOA. And then finally, in the advanced topics part, my colleagues are going to talk about decomposition techniques that would enable leveraging QAOA for larger problems, as well as some advanced simulation techniques using tensor networks. I hope you stick around.